Okay. Okay. So Ed, I can hear you and see you clearly. Boaz, hopefully you can uh, you can get on as well. Uh, that that's a mic symbol going up. I think there's uh, another symbol. Um, that's funny. <laughs> you want the mic okay you got the mic this is uh this is a interesting platform so to speak okay all right <laughs> on. You can, i just wanted to check that you can hear me but it's yeah we can, we can hear you fine but I, I don't know how this uh this is set up i mean you're supposed to be a speaker and by default you should have access to the mic <laughs> i will i will drop the mic and give it back to you then uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I'm hoping we can have some mic dropping moments here, but <laughs> uh, so good deal. I I, I know Sarif, um, Samir is just going to jump in. Uh, probably he's probably having the same issues. So look for, I'm keeping an eye on emails. Oh, no, he's joined a Zoom meeting. I don't know how that happened, but um, there's no Zoom meeting here. There you go. You're all here. <laughs> I thought for a moment there was some confusion in the Zoom meeting. I... Yeah, the links were a little wacky. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, that's always a backup, but I don't think for this one. <laughs> <laughs> Good deal. Well, uh, gentlemen, thanks for joining uh, joining this uh, this morning, afternoon. I guess it's it's already afternoon, and uh, maybe evening for those who joined us from the other parts of the world. Uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to. Uh, having this conversation especially with the backdrop of all that's going on i'm sure you're you are extremely busy as probably we are both for you know attending to incidents and also uh, supporting the uh, the ukrainian situation that's going on uh, so thank you for making time for this uh, event and the session and uh, particularly these thoughts uh, are going to be very extremely important going out to the rest of the community so uh, glad to be here. I'm, uh, I'm the chair for this session. I'm Val Mukherjee, the chairman and founder of Cyber Future Foundation, and and have been working with uh, Frank uh, on the uh, Horasis community for a long time. So, without further ado, I'd just like to introduce and then get a round of introductions done for for our distinguished speakers. And I'll go by the uh, by the uh, you know as it's arranged in my screen. So, Boaz, how about you go first? Uh, sure. I, I was hoping I wouldn't be first, so I'd uh, have a sense for how long you want us to introduce ourselves for, but I'll, I'll make mine brief. I'm Boaz Gilbert. I'm the uh, Chief Security Officer at uh, Akamai. Uh, previously, I was the CISO at uh, a number of other organizations at uh, Bloomberg, at uh, Dun & Bradstreet. Uh, originally, I'm a, a mathematician by training, and um, I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks for putting this together, and thanks for having me. Excellent. Thank you. Good to have you here, Boaz. Uh, Ed, how about you go, sir? Yes, uh, absolutely. My name is Ed Cabrera. I'm the Chief Cybersecurity Officer at Trend Micro. Uh, before joining Trend, I spent 20 years in the United States Secret Service, uh, working in many different uh, cybersecurity programs there, and to include um, being the Chief Information Security Officer before leaving. So uh, at Trend Micro, you know, what I do is essentially a lot of different things and wear many hats, but ultimately what I like and spend a lot of my time is on the research and development side of the house from a threat and vulnerability perspective. Um, not only work with our product teams, but also work with our customers. Excellent. Thank you for the introduction. Samir, how about you, sir? Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, Samir Sharif, I'm CISO for Imperva. Um, prior to Imperva, I spent uh, a couple of decades in Citigroup. Um, and primarily, I would say engineering development. I was a developer uh, when I first started my career many days ago with GE. Um, and uh, built security programs, different um, uh, compliance and technology-related uh, development work that I've led over the years at Imperva. My primary focus is ensuring uh, security and 
and our security posture related to our technologies, but also in our, our, from a corporate perspective as well, um, and as well as um, infrastructure and uh, risk management, clearly, um, from an overall security uh, perspective. Excellent. Thank you for that introduction. So this this covers, like, I think, a wide gamut of background that we need for this uh, interesting discussion. Uh, to give a little bit of backdrop uh, for this, uh, you know, we, we are talking about assessing uh, the organization's uh, cyber and physical weaknesses. Those who are so much closely tied together, as probably in your roles, you know, and and the business teams and, and different leaders who have joined this uh, Horasis community are going to um, uh, are going to tap into that. Uh, so every farm and every every nation, I would say, every organization is going through this whole uh, technological development and digital transformation. Uh, generally, there are a lot of solutions and there are a lot of products. And, and uh, uh, while the, uh, we are trying to keep up with that digital transformation, I think it's important for businesses to understand what would be the starting point. So to kick off this introduction and uh, to this topic, I would like to get your uh, kind of areas of focus where you think would be the starting point for us and in this uh, journey where do you expect business leaders to start from um, so uh, you know, how about we go with uh, Ed you first and then we'll go around this other table yeah and I, I think from a leadership perspective what you know be it CEOs or any um, of that executive team needs to really concentrate on it is really outcomes based, right? Impacts. And so when we talk about um, the impact of cyber uh, and physical systems, uh, especially now, I mean, what a difference, uh, you know, two weeks makes, right? You know, in the world landscape and, and when it comes to the cybersecurity and the threats that organizations and governments need to be looking at. And so I think primarily, you know, it's really first taking a really a baseline of what their exposure is and how interconnected their systems are, right, when it comes to um, cyber and physical systems. Um, the, the challenge we have as we really grow in smart buildings, uh, smart factories and smart cities and so forth is this high level of automation, but the high level of, of connectivity that is required. Uh, and so when we're talking about risk, it's really that intersection of, of, of where, you know, uh, these systems connect, right? And usually it's, unfortunately, it's at, at the people layer. Um, so the same IT risk that we, we talk about in cybersecurity, when we talk about OT, it's also people too there on the physical side. So ultimately it's getting that baseline of what are their systems um, uh, that they have online and what's the impact if those systems go down and you know, what are their interdependencies? So I would say that would be a good starting uh, place, uh, and especially for the co uh, conversation as well. Excellent. Um, I, and thanks for your thoughts. Uh, Boaz, how about you go next? Uh, sure, so yeah, I, I think one of the realities that, that we have today is that almost every company is essentially a technology company today. You know, they're a, a software company, uh, they may be more on the software side, more on the hardware side, but you know, even a company that uh, ostensibly makes widgets or does, you know, sell services or whatnot, the really core nervous system of that organization today is is technology. Um, you know, and I think that one of the reasons that cybersecurity is such a prominent area of focus right now is that a lot of organizations, their overall risk model hasn't caught up with that reality, so they're still thinking of risk in terms of, you know, here are you know, some of the consequences that could happen in the physical world, you know, you think uh, earthquakes, other things like that, um, you know, their, their risk model is, is is essentially anchored in the physical world. And I think one of the things that you're seeing, you know, particularly with, with some of the, the events that we've seen recently, but really a trend over recent years, is that the many of the things that could cause the, the most harm or the most likely to occur are, if not purely in the technology cyber realm, they're, they're at least hybrid. And so it really needs to be an area of, uh, an area of focus. Um, and, and I think that one of the core things that organizations can do, and, and this really touches on some of the pieces that um, that Ed was uh, was talking about, is to to do an inventory of what do you care about as an organization, what do you have, where where is it, um, you know, who are the various responsible parties for it, and, and from there to move to to a, a threat model and a risk management posture where you say, well, here are the things that could go wrong, 
and how well positioned am I in, in order to address those? Um, and I think the common underlying building block to, to facilitate all of that is really having the right governance within your organization. So, uh, you know, the, the, the folks, uh, the three of us on the call here, we, we have our, our, our jobs, I guess, to, to thank to that requirement for governance, right? So an organization needs somebody who essentially is, is overseeing and is owning that, is bringing that to the executive level. Um, you know, for different companies, it'll take a different form. Not, not every organization needs a, a CISO per se, right? But you do need to have somebody whose primary job function is to perform that, uh, that risk management. And that individual has to have sort of the, uh, the trust of the organization and has to have the, the pull in order to allocate resources, you know, to influence the allocation of resources and to ensure that risks that aren't being properly mitigated are being brought up to the executive attention for, for decisioning and for acceptance. And absolutely, I think I completely support that. And in the roles that I've been and, and seen across the different sectors, I think it can be more important than taking that governance and actually, you know, attending to the risk. So thank you for that, Boaz. Uh, Sami, how about your thoughts? Sure. Um, I'll, I'll start it off with, with a little bit of optimism, I think, because with, with all the things that are happening now and geopolitical issues that we all are facing, um, I really, as a CISO and even working with some of the community members, um, even my peers, this is our time to shine, right? Uh, I think we've, we've spoken for many years on the various themes, themes around, uh, you know, from an attention standpoint, we're focusing on security, digital and digital, you know, privacy and digital trust, perimeterless realities that we're operating with, um, shift left and I can go on. There are you know, various different areas and themes that we've been focusing on. Uh, and the reality is um, our the attention that we're getting from the organizations, the uh, our customers uh, around what we're doing to secure ourselves and the services we provide are really at the forefront. So it is a time to shine, but it's also time for us to kind of really not only step back, but also begin to have a much more clear risk conversation. Um, so for cloud security, for example, what are we do, doing around the growing reliance that we have on cloud as, as a business critical system, right? How are we going to continue to secure it? Uh, even if we're providing services around it, we still need to ensure that it's secure and operating securely. Um, so the, the reality of complex, you know, between the hybrid and multi-client environments is, 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 is obvious and one that businesses really need to understand. So the, the whole realm of cybersecurity really shifting more back to the business and, and translating it to a business risk because it becomes really, really important. Um, and some of the other areas from a thing perspective, like security of things, we talked about IoT and, and uh, explosion of connected devices. There's a clear convergence that we all need to think about. Um, even with or without the geopolitical challenges we're dealing with, there is ramification of the overall supply chain and the physical world kind of, you know, interwining together, um, including personal security safety. Um, so, I, you know, in, in general, I would say uh, this is really a critical point for us to begin to bring all of that back together from an impact standpoint. So for cloud security, for example, um, you know, the architecture is clearly a, a very, you know, a primary component that we have to constantly keep an eye on, uh, but also controlling the integrity, uh, both from a scale perspective, agility, uh, resilience becomes a very much important topic now to uh, keep the lights on, but also build the resiliency so we have an ongoing uh, reliance on uptimes and so forth. Um, and you, as you go through the, the various different themes that we've all been addressing, depending on our industry, obviously these themes may be slightly different, uh, but shift and left will need to continue to be an area, area of focus, um, especially from staff and professional perspective, where we continue, we will need to continue for them to understand you know, code security, but also be able to code with security in mind, right? So that's um, uh, an area that we need to begin to translate into a business opportunity and also build ongoing resiliency in our technologies and services. Certainly. And I think in a combination of the of the two that uh, you know, we, we need to be optimistic uh, towards how we can advance this uh, industry and the profession uh, towards building security into the in the into the product that we build in, uh, but also being you know able to defend and protect what we have already built. I think that we carry a huge legacy of digital systems that we haven't been uh, able to protect uh, to the same level of same level of and degree, right? Especially you know, in my in my last job, I I, I served as the chair of a EY's uh, energy security, 
um, for, for Americas and, and the vast amount of industry control systems and OT that we see um, straight around is, is another area that I know I'm personally very concerned. I'm sure the businesses are concerned too. So with that, let's let's break down these two areas. Let's let's talk about the cyber weaknesses in terms of the software systems, and then we'll go to the go to the hardware systems, and we see how we connect those two together with the lens of a business person and the, and the, and, the, and the cyber leaders enabling those businesses. So, Boaz, let me go to you next in terms of getting uh, or enumerating the cyber weaknesses. Again, I I have that radar up in terms of as you said, you're a trained mathematician. Uh, there are so many ways to think about it and problem solve. So, how about um, your thoughts on the cyber weaknesses in terms of those software systems that we have built and we are building? Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting because there's a uh, the, the the difference between math, which is very kind of clear cut and provable, and and, and software has often been a interesting uh, you know tension to observe over time. But you know, it, it's it, when when you think back around how. Uh, we we look at risks in the physical world for things that we've built. You, you can, you know, if you build a building, you'll have an inspection over time and you'll see that the wood, wood hasn't rotted and the foundations haven't. And, you know, if, if it has, you may be mandated by by your, uh, you know, your city or government to, to correct things. In, in software, the, the reality that we have today is that both in terms of software that organizations themselves have written or third party software that used by the hand, you know, by others, there is a complete spaghetti right, that, that just as an ecosystem, we really haven't wrapped our hands around in terms of, you know, leaving aside just security, how, how it works itself, right? That's a, there's, so, so there's a constantly sort of evolving ecosystem where new things are being written. A lot of old software is not being retired per se. And, you know, you'll often hear of people being brought out of retirement in order to kind of correct the lines of code that were written, you know, in some cases in the 1970s or, or 1980s. I, I think there's been a lot of improvements. You know, as Samir said, there, there's been a movement to what, what's called shift left and to kind of get earlier in the process, so to speak, uh, in terms of software. But, but the reality is that the, the supply chain for software is one of the most complex challenges that I think organizations have today. Even just understanding what all software you as an organization depend on is, is, is a really, um, you know, overwhelming and daunting task. You know, recently um, I was at the uh, White House summit on uh, open source security. And open source, you know, has enabled an incredible amount of innovation in the recent years. It's, it's fair to say that we wouldn't have, you know, the internet that we have today and the, the mobile ecosystem that we have today without open source. Um, but also it's, it's stunning when you think of just the reliance that we have as society on pieces of open source software that are literally maintained by one or two people. Uh, you know, there's a, uh, there's a cartoon that you may have seen doing the rounds which has all modern digital infrastructure is this big tower on top and it's sitting kind of, you know, the, the Jenga game, it's sitting on this one little stick and that stick is labeled, you know, piece of code maintained by, you know, some guy in Nebraska since 2003 or, or something like that. And that's, that's actually pretty close to being true for some of the key things like, you know, the software that keeps time on all of our servers and all sorts of things of that nature. Um, so, you know, and, and Log4j, you know, which, which happened in December, really was just a, an example of this or a manifestation of this, where you had this extremely commonly used, um, you know, software package, which had been looked at over the years by a bunch of people, but that's maintained by a really skeletal crew, you know, great set of folks who are, you know, doing terrific volunteer work, but who, you know, I, I don't think it could have been anticipated just the level of dependency that there was on that piece of software. And then when a vulnerability was found on it, it had you know, very widespread uh, implications in terms of the risk exposure that, that organizations had. Um, so that's one of the reasons that, you know, that the White House uh, convened this meeting uh, and is, is looking to, uh, you know, really create kind of a collaboration between public-private partnership in terms of how do we identify those pieces of software where we have that dependency. And, uh, you know, one of the, the takeaways there is to see, like, can we, as, a, as an ecosystem, identify the 100 or 200 most common ones? And, and can we you know, start to work to put resources towards that as a community and, and to secure it. But I think what organizations can really do today in this area is to ensure that for their developers, uh, or, the, you know, and if they're not doing development themselves, if they've, if they've outsourced that, there's at least a realization of this, uh, of this issue. And they're looking for, you know, how do we at least kind of catalog our risks in this area? Because, you know, in Log4j, certainly organizations that had inventories in place had a reasonable sense of what's where i think we're much more able to situation quickly than, than ones which were just starting that process so uh you know i'm afraid it's a not maybe a very uh, uh sort of 
happy in the short term kind of uh, problem that we yeah. face, uh, but I think it is one that's going to be, you know, one of the, the major th major themes in cybersecurity over the coming years. Absolutely. And I think every challenge yeah. and opportunity we have uncovered so many over the last few just months or weeks, I would say we definitely take that forward. So, Ed, uh, so your, your thoughts around that? Yeah, no, no, I, I think absolutely. Um, he's right on all those aspects. I mean, as, as far as like, for example, from a tracker perspective, we actively work on, um, we have the, our zero day initiative program, which we're able to identify uh, or leverage like 3,000 uh, researchers, not 3,000 trend micro researchers, 3,000 independent researchers uh, looking for, um, you know, bugs and being able to pay for those bugs, right? And so this bug bounty program is really interesting for us because we're able to then take those um, vulnerabilities that we are able to uh, identify and then be able to provide, you know, fixes for our customers uh, 120 days before it's even disclosed. So, you know, I think there is, like he mentioned, there is definitely, it is a uphill challenge. We even, we in cybersecurity have been focused on heavily on the threat side and, uh, but it, it's this vulnerability um, management uh, challenge that, you know, we often talk about, we need a playbook for the threats that we face, right? Or our organizations from a people process and technology need to have playbooks to deal with, you know, you name the threat, um, fill in the blank. But I think when we talk about the, the vulnerability side of the house, oftentimes we've, we've had this um, concept where, you know, every vulnerability needs to be patched and that's just not sustainable. It's impossible to do. So prioritization of vulnerabilities that are currently being exploited in the wild is, is that focus area where organizations have to really work towards, right? It's, it's, it's not an easy thing, but uh, we just, um, uh, just a, an hour before this call, we were working with CISA and their critical vulnerabilities, um, disclosures of, of, of vulnerabilities that are actually being exploited in the wild. Um, and so even connected to the world events as, as we're talking about. And so um, this, this area of really focusing on those that are actually being exploited in the wild where organizations need to focus their efforts there first to do their patching is incredibly important. So although, yes, the the challenge is, is big, but not ins, uh, insurmountable. And, and so what we're doing now from a public private area is that's where we're focused on because, you know, there's one thing is secure code and, and the areas of, you know, um, uh, bill of, of, you know, secure bill of uh, materials, you know, SBOMs and, and our software bill of materials. Or I, I think that from a software development perspective um, is it, going to be critical. But the challenge is, as he, he mentioned, is, is that, you know, all these pieces of code be it open source and the percentage of open source code in software is a huge challenge. But then, you know, we need to take it to that next step and really say what's actionable, what can organizations do and where do they need to focus first? And so uh, it's always been this challenge when it comes to vulnerability management, um, because we've taken this, uh, even the CVSS scores that are out there are not necessarily commensurate to the risk that organizations have. So these vulnerabilities that are scored based on um, their risk profiles might not be a, a critical vulnerability for one organization, might not be a critical vulnerability for others. And so, you know, you know, the maturation of how do we do this in such a way that we can speed up um, our, our patching cycle and what do we need to do via vis-a-vis -vis virtual patching uh, to, to be able to apply some level of protection before these, you know, before you can actually, you know, patch a system because it's, it, it's a difficult proposition to begin with uh, depending on the area. And when we're talking about cyber physical um, threats in, in the physical notion, you have real-time systems, you have operational risk associated with uh, even just taking a system down to be able to, to patch it, right? So all these things come into play to make things much more complicated. But um, I, I think definitely there is um, areas of progress that's being made. And so, you know, from our perspective, it's, it's a challenge, but we're, we're meeting that challenge. So no, thanks for I kind of reiterating the the different options that we have, and also the the need to prioritize where we invest time. And 
uh, and also uh, take advantage of programs that you mentioned about drug bounty programs and crowd, not only open sourcing this, but also open so using open source, but also crowdsourcing the voluntary uh, you know, identification and management portion. So thank you for that. Uh, Samir, how are your thoughts on this area? You're, you're deeply embedded in this uh, space, right? Yes, I'm very deeply embedded. And uh, honestly, I mean, so I would say yesterday, so add you know, many years to that or today. So yesterday we were all talking about frameworks and just, you know, if you find a high risk vulnerability and it meets the CBSS score, you just fix it, right? Today, we're really more about having conversation around risk. Um, it's not just a question of exploit, whether your vulnerability is exploitable, but it's also priority, right? So the risk conversation is important because ultimately, you know, we, you know, we are accountable to risk, but we don't own it, right? It's the businesses that own that. And there needs to be clarity around what makes sense, what's really critical in terms of the business, the business posture, business's risk appetite, and what they want to, right? And also in, in combination of your customer base, you have to really have a good understanding of who you're dealing with and also what are the impacts and risks to them, right, from a regulatory or from other aspects. Um, but equally important is, is being smart about risk because we know that there's going to be ongoing growing attack surfaces. You know, there's an increase in how many security tools we need to constantly evolve and, and secure our businesses. Uh, but it's also important to kind of get back to the basics around managing risk, even at the development level. So long before you even discover vulnerabilities, um, you know, just as Boaz said, and he's spot on, our dependency on open source is going to keep growing. So how is it being introduced? What's your build of material? Do you have standard mechanisms to uh, assess and manage um, you know, components and other dependencies and libraries that are constantly being uh, leveraged? And even more so, from a quality standpoint, are developers just throwing everything into your, into your code base just because it's easy to do versus really thinking through or working from a clean quality perspective. So I think it's become so complex for us now. We have to not only deal with cyber and from a security risk, but we also need to kind of, when, when Boaz has shift left, we have to actually shift our stuff left as well and begin to talk about just engineering practices. Um, it's, it's not just about throwing tools at our organization. It's also about making sure that we can help them actually ingrain that as part of their day to day. Um, so I, I totally agree uh, with the, both comments, um, but it's, it is not a perfect science. Um, and, you know, if anything, if there's an area that we really need to begin to, as an industry, to think about more seriously, probably around discovery and intel, uh, discovery from solutions that can probably give us better visibility around emerging risks, um, you know, instrumenting an app, for example, to, di to discover the next Log4j. And, and not really wait for researchers to tell us you have a zero day. Um, that's going to be the evolution that I think um, at least I'm trying to focus on as well. Certainly. No, very well thought. Uh, Rob, so I, I think, you know, let's extend this discussion from our experiences in the cyber system to physical systems. And I'll give you a little bit of context. I, I hosted a roundtable back in Jan December with the energy sector leaders. And then you can imagine that the vast amount of industry control systems and OT systems that we have if what we have learned from this uh, from maintaining cyber code uh, software code and making sure those vulnerabilities are addressed you can imagine the pain that that the industry has to go through on the industrial control system side and ot side in the energy sector and other you know physical sectors where there are decades and multiple decades of uh, of uh, of devices that are there that are not equipped to even be connected so that we don't even know uh, you know what's out there so uh, maybe um, Ed, I start with you uh, with some examples and experiences that we can share from the software world, but uh, try to transition some of these practices to the hardware world, first addressing legacy and also now building something new. So both, both addressing this broad spectrum that we have to address. Yeah, I mean, the, the challenges that we talk about is, is this exponential growth of our what we call our attack service, right? So be it IT um, devices, uh, but obviously more and more you have OT devices uh, in terms of internet of things, but also um, industrial IOT devices where you're looking at more and more that um, sensors that are being deployed uh, either from building automation systems or factory floors um, becoming much more capable even at 
at the levels of retaining uh, critical data, but also um, being a part of a, an overall system that, again, going back to the um, challenges of, uh, of these devices and being interdependent and linked. And so we always talk about having challenges of shadow IT. And if really, if you don't see it, it's a basic tenet of security. If you don't see it, you can't protect it. And so when we talk about from a hardware perspective, I think, you know, um, this explosive growth of IoT devices, industrial IoT devices and commercial off the shelf, it is creates opportunities to improve your uh, efficiencies and productivity within your organizations. But it becomes a huge challenge, right, for you know, those that are trying to manage risk in your organization. So th this aspect of this ballooning uh, attack surface it, it is the challenge because now we're talking about sensors that are not just passive. Now we're talking about sensors that actually are controlling physical systems. Um, so you take a you take the smart city aspect to it, and you tar and you look at traffic systems being able to then control uh, traffic systems. Uh, uh, so it's not just monitoring traffic systems where originally it, you know everything started. Now you're looking at traffic systems that are, are smart and adaptable. Um, and that has huge impacts. Uh, and you know when it comes to possibly being uh, either targeted from a cyber perspective and or even from a physical, physical situation where you have natural disasters and or these systems just going down and how does that affect everything else? So I think, I mean, on the physical side, on the hardware side, I think you're looking at um, ultimately when you look at the hardware piece, we've always talked about supply chain in the hardware sense, not the software sense. And I think we really covered the software sense, but you know, the hardware piece is, you know, a lot of challenges, I mean, that are going on now. And, and so uh, we had this weird world, uh, surreal world that we're looking at. You have chipsets um, that, you know, we have manufacturing that is almost um, bringing to a crawl because of the uh, chip shortages and stuff like that. So the idea is that then you have to start thinking, okay, from a risk perspective, what is that introduced? Does that introduce, you know, less... Um, uh, you know, lower quality chipsets that are awesome uh, being made quickly in another fa uh, fa uh, fabrication center that possibly didn't have the quality controls. All these necessary things that you look at from a hardware perspective then gets introduced. Obviously, you have the intentional malicious uh, actors, but then you have the, the unintentional issues that come with um, creating vulnerabilities associated with those hardware on those chipsets due to lack of quality control and quality assessment. So I think things, especially from a U.S. centric perspective, these fabrications are being moved from offshore to uh, onshore and so forth. So it reduces risk. But those are the challenges I see when it comes to now, now on the hardware side is this exponential growth of IoT and industrial IoT and how that impacts everything from smart cities, buildings, and, and factories. Absolutely. And I think that that scale is by itself a challenge and then the security vulnerability and that an expansion of attack surface to an exponential growth. So thank you for the thought. Now, Samir, how about uh, your thoughts on, on, on the taking the learning from the software side and applying to the physical side? Sure. Um, I think, uh, as you mentioned, I mean, the, the physical side is interesting because I remember um, I mean, Boaz and I are both in the, 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 the protection business, right, for DDoSes. Um, and I remember uh, reading an article, I think it was an IDC, but they were talking about like close to 56 billion uh, connected devices worldwide um, will be the reality like in, in, in the next four years. And that's a lot of devices with, guess what, software, right? Um, and how do you secure those software and how, you know, how, who's maintaining it, uh, what vulnerabilities are on it? Who knows? Um, and I think what's going to be even more interesting is with 5G, everything is going to start to move, you know, the, just kind of think about kind of the expansion and how quickly data will begin to be able to transfer back and forth. So if I'm a bad guy, um, you know, this is this is the time for them. Probably they're thinking, oh, how can I we take advantage of that? But guess what? We're also thinking about it, uh, both from a critical infrastructure standpoint and um, and I'm sure manufacturing companies are all over this because it is it is a huge growing risk, um, and it's one that's going to complicate how we think about 
protection, vulnerabilities, um, every equipment, right? From farming equipment to uh, equipment you rely on for just your smart meters, for example, could be an attack surface. Um, so way beyond basics, I think, you know, you know, the thoughts around just from a scale perspective, right? If, if, I'm, if I'm providing a service today, protect our customers from DDoS, then that's gonna you know, be a hundred times more difficult in the next four years. So innovation begins today. Uh, yeah. But also for our industry, I think, and our customers, and even at the individual level, uh, who are dealing with these, with these physical types of uh, technologies and, and products, we, we need to begin to educate folks a lot more about this risk, right? Um, we can't just ignore the, the human sitting at home and, you know, not upgrading their home firewalls anymore. Um, I, I think, you know, inherently we, we need to all roll our sleeves and, and take a more active approach um, to think about the space. Sure thing. Yeah. And thank you for that. So, Boaz, moving on to you, I mean, you know, you have an expansive infrastructure as much as you have the software. So, um, how are you looking at uh, protecting both? Yeah. So, you know, certainly we have, um, you know, um, 350,000 odd servers spread all over the world. And, you know, core, core part of that is ensuring that we provide defense to, uh, you know, to our, to our customers that they get hit with, uh, with bot nets and with DDoS attacks and, and, and so forth. I mean, I, I completely agree with both um, Ed and Samir's points around the explosion of IoT devices uh, being a, a large scale security challenge. You know, I, the other day, I just, out of curiosity, I, I did what's called an NMAP scan of my, my home network. So I kind of just <laughs> scanned, like, what do I have on my home network? And I came up with close to 80 devices, I mean, just like random stuff, like the, you know, the light switches, which I automated and the smoke, smoke alarm and the, all the Raspberry Pis that I play around with and all, all that kind of stuff. And that's probably not an unusual setup, uh, you know, for, for a lot of folks. I mean, increasingly, you know, your, your fridge and your toaster and all that kind of stuff is, it's also going to be online, you know, people's, uh, the scale that they use to weigh themselves, et cetera. Um, and, and certainly from an economics perspective, a lot of those things are not being rolled out with a, you know, a long-term security model, right? They're, they're not meant to be, they're, they're not kind of thinking of a bigger security challenge and they're not thinking that, well, maybe they're being placed on the same network as a, uh, as a camera or as another device that's, uh, that's more sensitive. Um, and we saw, we've seen uh, some cases in which that has been exploited. So for example, you had uh, something called the Mirai botnet a number of years ago, where a number of IOT devices were kind of commandeered. Um, and that was a pretty large scale uh, botnet, but I, I think we're probably gonna see more of that in the future as people figure out ways to, uh, to, to exploit all of these various different systems. Um, and you know, as, as was also alluded to, it, there's sort of the consumer side of this, but there's very much also the industrial side and, and the enterprise side of this, where for example, you know, cars and airplanes and medical devices and all of these things being connected online. And that already begins to have much more serious ramifications if, you know, if those were potentially to be, uh, to be compromised. The, uh, I guess the uh, silver lining or what I would say, like I, I think in the, in the short term, I, I'm pessimistic around the security outlook for that exploding ecosystem and the ability of security to keep up with all of that uh, growth and all of that complexity. But I think in the more medium term, there are a lot of security benefits that can come from these devices, right? We already see, and uh, you know, many folks uh, in, in the kind of adjacent spaces have uh, to security have written about this, but how crime levels have gone down and many, you know, of, of certain types of crimes have gone down because there is an ability to, you know, uh, kind of know what's going on, right? There, there's obviously privacy implications there, very serious privacy implications that need to be taken into account. But the, the ability to just sort of do something nefarious and, and not leave a trail behind you is, is, is really has shrunk. And, and that changes the, the risk calculus and the, the risk reward calculus uh, in, in terms of, uh, you know, criminals. And, and I think we're going to see uh, security teams themselves, cyber teams, be able to, uh, you know, leverage these new technologies in a way also to improve security. The other trend that I think we see is that the security community is coming up with solutions for how to mitigate some of the risks that these new technologies pose. So, for example, micro segmentation is a is a new trending uh, you know security uh, tool that folks are using to say you know you want to within your environment be able to micro segment all of the you know the air conditioning system and all the other stuff that could be a way in from your core system. So, medium to long term, I'm. Uh, sort of bullish around this, the security prospects for, for those new technologies. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we need to stay, stay up, uh, up front uh, and all these challenges as, as, as it grows and apply those learnings from the past into these new upcoming areas. 
so with that i think we discussed a, a variety of of, uh, of approaches and array of problems of course and how do we go about this uh, in the last 5 minutes i want to quickly wrap on uh, probably you know the the cyber risk angle at large now combining these two topics that we discussed and how do what was what would be your uh, final thoughts in a minute or two to talk about um, and approach this from the ceo and the business leaders that are joining us today and we'll be hearing this problem program later yep. sure i'll be happy to take that i just realized how much time we have left um, i want to qualify the, your question actually in, in, a, in a couple of ways one is to be clear, really, what we talk about, what, what do we mean when we talk about cybersecurity? Because I think we've had an evolution where we're saying, well, we're information security professionals, as CISOs, but we're shifting more towards cyber. And the reality is they're not the same. Um, it's still information security. As, you know, from everything I've done, my prior life has also always been about privacy and data, right? So protecting data and services. But cyber is taking the forefront because we are more and more thinking about how we protect our systems and networks. Um, but in terms of thinking about cybersecurity and how do we take that back to a business conversation it is is more about really combining three different elements. So information security, continuing business should, should be really a, a key part of um, the overall aspect, but also from technology and architecture um, standpoint. And cyber is really in many ways a convergence between the three. So in one aspect, when we think about data, data security and also access to data, but there's also a third party risk component to it. There's an encryption component to it. Continuity of business from resiliency is always an important aspect. Um, and just, not just from general resiliency, but also around the overall uh, planning and crisis management, um, which is obviously a, a core component of what we do as security professionals. And, and the other is just the overall technology aspect of it, from architecture and convergence, then it becomes like, you know, making sure we have really good visibility around the asset. Uh, uh, our assets and open source technology we should prevent. And, uh, um, and as, as Boaz was mentioning about micro segmentation, it's not a bad thing to have an extra firewall at home, right? And begin actually just doing the, the simple things to segment yourself from the risk. Uh, but perimeter, perimeter from an organization level is, is, is an important one as well. Uh, and last day uh, from a cyber is intelligence. But in the convergence of all, all of these components is really what cyber is um, from a risk management uh, capability and bringing that to a business conversation is really what is the next step for us um, so we are kind of seen less from an execution leader to more a business enabler and having a risk conversation so the, the shift to really presenting our data and, and risk posture is not about vulnerabilities and how much threats we are able to mitigate versus really how we're helping the businesses uh, evolve and get invited to a seat at the table. Yeah, thank you, Samir. Um, Ed, your thoughts are in, in final minute of, uh, of how do we present this to the business uh, and, and how do they go about it? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's um, like we've been talking about, the business side is really translating, right? You know, I always think of the, as a CISO here, the chief translator, a translator for the organization, right? You're bringing to bear the technical to uh, to the business side, right? And, and, and you do it, a nice bridge way to do that is through risk, right? Because on the business side, business already knows and is very familiar and understands quantitative and qualitative risk. And so I think having that conversation on the business side is about managing and mitigating risk. But I think one example I would say is a good friend of mine, he was uh, CISO uh, with a, uh, a cancer organization, a global cancer organization. And this cancer organization was very, you know, very focused on obviously providing a, a level of service to those, uh, you know, th that they were serving. And, and so a part of that was providing actual residences for families during their cancer treatment. And so what this uh, CISO did was create a dashboard and really align it, right? Because it's all about alignment. If you can't align it to to the the basic objectives and goals to the on the business side, then obviously, yeah, your seat at the table doesn't exist. You might be have a kitty table, <laughs> you know, outside. They call you when they need you, so to speak. But truly, to talk about business, what he did was he really broke it down in terms of, hey, um, what. I'm able to do by preventing a breach at this organization is I'm able to save the organization X amount of dollars. 
And by the way, that is equates to, and I'm just filling in the blank, six homes, right, for families this year by the work that we're doing is we're saving um, and, being, and, and being able to enable, you know, that, uh, that mission objective for the organization. So I always thought that was a f- fantastic way for CISOs to be able to, you know, really the alignment is key. Because ultimately, what you're trying to do on the business side is answer the question, why? Why should they care to listen to you? Why do you matter? And, you know, why what you and your team does, uh, you know, it affects the organization and its overall business goals. And so uh, I'll just leave it at that and we're running out of time. But I really think it's the alignment, the messaging, and, and really uh, focus on how you can enable the business mission, not um, disable the business mission. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Um, Boaz, your, your last uh, few uh, comments, sir. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep mine brief because I know we're at the negative one minute here. Uh, but for you know, for folks on the call uh, who, who are watching who are on boards or, or uh, you know, CEOs or leaders of their company, I think the most important component is to ensure that you have a visibility at the board level. So that there's somebody who has been designated, who's been empowered to bring cyber concerns and, and that risk picture to the board. Uh, you know, often audit committee is a great place to do this, uh, but just having that regular cadence that at each one of those audit committee meetings, you have a presentation on cyber, there's a consistency to it, uh, that the executive leadership and the board has the opportunity to, uh, you know, familiarize themselves with the overall cyber narrative of the company, the risk narrative of the, of the organization. Um, I think that that's really, really important. Absolutely. No, thank you. I mean, this is this has been a very, very informative session and then I couldn't expect more. Uh, so uh, thank you so much, gentlemen, for t- covering our time from, from your busy day to, to you know, share your uh, thoughts and your leading practices here. I mean, having been part of at least a board conversation every week in the last several years, I've realized that there are three topics uh, other than the rest of the business that, uh, that boards have started caring about. One is ESG, the other is diversity, equity, and inclusion, and the third is cyber. Each of them are, are so important to not only the businesses, but the communities and the customers we serve. I absolutely think this uh, cyber topic touches all of that together. So thank you so much. Have a great rest of the day and uh, hope to connect and uh, work with you on the next opportunity as well. So thank you so much. Thanks for thank having you. me. Great Thanks for having me.